Reading through the Bible in one year, July 7th, Joshua chapter 9, Psalms 140 through 141, Jeremiah 3, and Matthew chapter 17. Now, it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan, in the hill country, and in the lowland, and on the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, sorry, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard of it, that they gathered themselves together with one accord to fight Joshua and with Israel, or fight, rather fight with Joshua and with Israel. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, and Ai they also uh, acted craftily and set out as, sent, set out as envoys and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and, and wo- sorry, and wineskins worn out and torn and mended and worn out and, uh, sorry, and patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes on themselves. And all the bread of their provisions was dry and had become crumbled. Then they went to Joshua and to the camp at Gilgal and said to the men, uh, sorry, to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a far country and now therefore make a covenant with us. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you are living within our land. How then shall we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, we, we are your servants. Then Joshua said to him, well, or said to them, who are you and where do you come from? And they said to him, your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of the Lord of your, sorry, of the Lord your God. For we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon king of Heshbon and to Og king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. So our elders and the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions in your hand for the journey, and go and meet them, and say to them, We are your servants. Now then, make a covenant with us. This was our bread when, rather, this our bread was warm when we took it for our provisions out of our houses on the day that we left uh, to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and has become crumbled. These wineskins, which we uh, filled, uh, were new. And behold, they are torn, and these are clothes, and and our sandals are worn out because of the very long journey. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for counsel from the Lord. This is a... This is an issue going forward with them. Where they do not ask for counsel from the Lord, and bad things happen to them. This is kind of a warning for them ahead of time, saying, come to me first in all things. But they did not ask for counsel from the Lord, and Joshua just made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of their congregations swore an oath to them. So now they're bound by their oath, right? And their oaths, they swear by God. So if they were to violate this oath, then they would be violating the law of God, and they would be lying in the face of God, um, in this case. So it came about at the end of only three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were neighbors and that they were living with them in their land. Then the sons of Israel set out and came to their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Shepherah and Beeroth and Kiriath-Jerim. The sons of Israel did not strike them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And the whole congregation grumbled against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the whole congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This we shall do to them. And uh, rather, this we will do to them, even let them live, so that, they, so that wrath will not be upon us for the oath which we have sworn to them. The leaders said to them, Let them live. So they became hewers of wood and drawers of water for the whole congregation, just as the leaders had spoken to them. And to be honest, it, it's, it works out far better from them, sorry, for them than everybody else who gets basically wiped out, man, woman, and child. Then Joshua called for them and spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us? Saying, We are very far from you when you are living within our land. Now, therefore, you are cursed. 
and you shall never cease being slaves, both hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. So they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told your servants that the Lord your God has commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. Therefore we feared greatly for our lives because of you and have done this thing. Again, they acted in fear of God, which is a good thing, but they lied about it. And they were being uh, crafty in the way they handled it. Now, behold, we are in your hands. Do as it seems good and right in your sight to do to us. And thus he did to them, and delivered them from the hands of the sons of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, and to this day in the place which he would choose. Let's go on to Psalms 140 through 141. Rescue me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who devise evil things in their hearts. They continually stir up wars. They sharpen their tongues as a serpent. A poison of a viper is under their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purpose to trip up my feet. The proud have hidden a trap for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set snares for me. I said to the Lord, You are my God. Give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplications. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not promote his evil device, that they will not be exalted. As for the head of those who surround me, May the mischief of their lips cover them. May burning coals fall upon them. May they be cast into the fire, into deep pits from which they cannot rise. May a slanderer not be established in the earth. May evil hunt the violent man speedily. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. The upright will dwell in your presence. Psalm 141 O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice deeds of wickedness with men who do iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. What is he saying? He's saying, Lord, keep me from lying. Keep me from saying things that are untrue. Keep me from being boastful. He's saying, please change my heart so that I don't want to do the evil things that my heart wants to do. Again, Romans chapter 7, we talked about this. At the very end, Paul, um, the great planter of churches throughout all of Asia Minor, still was saying near the end of his ministry that he was still struggling with the sin that's within him, and how when he wants to do good, he still struggles against that. And that's Paul an apostle of the Lord who had the same thing. And so this is what this is what David is saying here. Do not inc- uh, sorry incline my heart uh, to any evil thing, to practice deeds of wickedness with men who do iniquity and do not let me eat of their delicacies. They actually have nice things that they have among them. Don't let me go near that. Keep me, Lord, holy, keep me separate from those things. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. And do not let my head refuse it, for still my prayer is against their wicked deeds. Their judges are thrown down by the sides of the rock. They hear my words, for they are pleasant. As when one plows the and breaks open the earth, our bones have been scattered at the mouth of Sheol. 
for my eyes are toward you, O God the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. Keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me, and keep these sorry, and from the snares of those who do iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by safely. And that is all the notes. Let's go on to Jeremiah chapter 3. Again, as a warning, these are just longer chapters anyway. Um, if you look at this first chapter, sorry, first verse, it is ridiculously long. Uh, the reason for this is just because um, when they were um, laying out verse numbers for, for this book, whoever did it didn't do it the same way that they've been done in other places. That's all. Remember that the verse numbers themselves uh, are not, um, they're not holy, right? They're not inspired. They're just numbers to make it easier for us to read it. All right. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, Will he still return to her? Will not that land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot, a whore, with many lovers. Yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. Again, this is the, the same complaint God had about them beforehand, right? What he's saying is that, um, that's a good way to put this. Their true husband of the people of Israel has been God the Father, right? But they have been playing the whore in that they've been going around and experimenting with all of these other um, idols, the gods of the land, the gods of the hills, the gods of the trees, the gods of the valleys, uh, the gods of, of the, the, the plants and the animals and whatever else, the gods of the sun and the moon and the stars and whatever it is that they're, that they're um, spending their time and effort into, right? But their God is the God of all creation. He is the God of the sun and the moon and the stars and the plants and the animals and the hills and the valleys, he is the God of all of these things because he created them all and owns them all. But yet they're going out and they're worshiping trinkets, right? Pieces of wood and stone in holy places that they've called for themselves, which largely just means that they've been uh, finding places to have orgies and other such things while they, um, you know, serve these other gods. So the issue that we see here is that God's concern, as was in chapter 2, is being continued here. That's why he sees it this, in this way. Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see. Again, these are the, the high mountains that they would go up and have these orgies. Where have you not been violated? By the roads you have sat for them, like an Arab in the desert. And you have a polluted, rather, you have polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld. God has been preventing them from having um, any rain. This is something that He's been doing. He's basically causing them to have a um, a famine because of what they've been doing. And there has been no spring rain. Yet you had a harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. And, sorry, have you not now just called to me? My father, you are the friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, you have spoken and have done evil things, and you have had your way. He's like, look, you, you, you come to me all nice and, oh, please help me because of this thing. No. They have continually rejected God over and over and over and over and over. And now, now that things are getting tough, that's when they come back. Remember, we talked about this yesterday. Then the Lord said to me, in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? 
She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a whore there. I thought, after she has done these things, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister, Judah, saw it. And I saw that for uh, all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister, Judah, did not fear. But she went as a harlot also. Because of the the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. These are gods of stones and gods of trees. Basically, just the little idols themselves made of things. Yet, in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception. Again, we talked about this before. This is the person who goes out and gets just hammered drunk every single night. And when they're lying there and, and the room is spinning and they're, they're afraid they're not going to make it through the night and they're super, super sick and they're having all of these issues, that's when they call out to God. And that's when they ask him to please save them. And they make a laundry list of promises. I'll stop drinking. I'll stop cheating around. I'll stop doing this. I'll stop doing that. God, just please save me tonight. And when they wake up in the morning, as God has given to the people of Israel, and to the people of Judah. They go, oh, I'm fine. Then they go right back to what they were doing. Because again, they don't care. They don't care what God has to say about any of these things. And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. That's a hard statement. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. And have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree. And have not uh, obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord. For I am a master to you. And I will take you from a city, uh, or rather I will take you one from a city and two from a family. And I will bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart. These are their their teachers and pastors and elders who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. And it shall be in those days when you are multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord, that they will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And it will not even come into mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made again. Because again, that was one of the, that was one of the, um, The great things that they would say, oh, well, we know that God is for us because of the ark, right? At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord. uh, Again, remember, name means the character and nature of who God is, not just the word the Lord, right, or Yahweh or Jehovah, nor will they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. They're going to come back home. Then I said, How would you set you, rather, how would I set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of the nations? And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from following me. Surely, as a woman treacherously departs from her lover, so you have uh, dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. A voice is heard on the bare heights, the weeping and the supplication of the sons of Israel, because they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. 
Return, O faithless sons, I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Surely the hills are a deception, a tumult on the mountains. Surely in the, uh, in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. But the shameful thing has consumed the labor of our fathers since our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame and let our humiliation cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, and rather we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day, and we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. That's all the notes. Let's go to Matthew 17. Six days later, six days later after what? After Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there are some of those standing here today who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days after that, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up on, on a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them. His figure, his, his body changed in front of them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. They are experiencing now what is called the Shekinah glory of God, the bright, fiery light that comes out of God, that lets you know his holiness and who he is. These three people God has chosen to take with him to reveal his glory to them, and even in 1 Peter, Peter calls back to this moment as when he had seen the glory of God. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it, it, it is good for us to be here. If, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles, tents, here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He had no idea what to say. He just felt he had to say something. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. Jesus came up to them and touched them and said, Get up. Do not be afraid. Jesus knows who it was. It was his father. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Again, they don't quite understand what he means. And his disciples asked him, well, why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, and he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, well, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Again, on that mountain thing, we brought this up before, but that was a common idiom in that time for something that was impossible, right? That's what's being meant here. So you will, you will do the impossible is what he's saying. Now, quick note. 
do you see this little bracket? This little bracket here and a little bracket there. What that means is that the section we're about to read was not um, probably in the original manuscripts. We have very old manuscripts um, that we can uh, now go back and find using things like CBGM, the coherence-based genealogical model, where you can look at all of the, the various versions, uh, not versions, but the various translations of the text over time. And even when it's been in the same language, we can, we can now start to trace out um, using a, a lot of heavy computing work um, where little changes to the text came in. Again, they're nothing bad. It's not saying, you know, and here Jesus said, I'm a walrus. And suddenly, you know, he's a walrus and he turned everybody into circus clowns. That's not the case. What, what we see are little things like uh, scribed notes. Where, like, if you have your Bible and you write a note in there, well, imagine somebody um, in your family, your, your, um, say you pass your Bible down to your children um, and then they want to pass it down to their multiple children, they'll rewrite the Bible for them instead of just passing down the one book. But when they would rewrite it, sometimes they would include these notes as the text itself. Or they would just change the wording for things. And we'll see that as well. There's um, uh, some names that are spelled one way someplace and another way somewhere else. Uh, that's a common thing. Uh, or misspellings of simple words, things like that. So just know that ahead of time. This next sentence I'm about to say probably was not original to the text, but we just read it for, his, for the historical part to know that it was there. All right. Now, Jesus, apparently relating to the stuff before, the, the, the scribe note says, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, that's the end of that section of the, you know, the bits that probably were not part of the original text. Now we go back to what was in the original text. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, again, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher uh, pay, sorry, not pay the two drachma tax? And he said, Yes. When he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said, From strangers. And Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. However, so that you don't offend them, go to the sea and just throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Bringing up the rest of the notes here. There we go. Now, be, to be honest, I, I would love it. Love it to death if I could pay taxes like this. It would be amazing if I just go and throw a you know hook out in the middle of the lake somewhere and pull it up and all my taxes are paid. That would be amazing. But, you know, we live under the curse. So, all right, um, that's it for now. We will be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.